we are so pleased to welcome Christine Bold as our uh, keynote this afternoon. Dr. Bold is professor in the School of English and Theater Studies at University of Guelph, Ontario. Uh, since the publication of her first monograph in the late 80s, she's been a major voice in one of the most significant contexts for Cody studies, that is uh, US popular print culture of the late 18th, uh, early, uh, late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, that first book was Selling the Wild West, Popular Western Fiction, 1860 to 1960, a substantive survey of this quintessentially American subgenre that includes a study of Buffalo Bill's first mythologizer, uh, Ned Buntline. And it's a necessary first stop for uh, anyone studying that corpus. She went on to write and edit five more books, as well as numerous articles that engaged other interests, such as public funding for the arts in the New Deal era, as well as a project memorializing violence against women. But she has repeatedly returned to the subject of the West in popular culture, most lo notably with two books. Uh, her volume for the Oxford History of uh, Popular Print Culture on US Popular Print Culture, 1860 to 1920, uh, another uh, indispensable resource for scholars in the field. And um, the award-winning The Frontier Club, Popular Westerns and Cultural Power, 1880 to 1924, also uh, published with Oxford UP in 2013, and winner of the 2014 Thomas J. Lyon Book Award in Western American Literary and Cultural Studies uh, from the Western Literature Association. And it's just one of its uh, many recognitions. It offers a, a particular history of popularization centered on the efforts of the so-called Frontier Club, a group of men, many associated with the Boone and Crockett Club, who infused the frontier myth with their own uh, ideological project. Dr. Bold's current work focuses on popular performance um, with the history of Indian performers in vaudeville. Please join me in welcoming Christine Bold. Thank you very much. I'm afraid I've got microphone phobia. Can you hear me okay without, am I yelling at you? No, I'm fine. Okay, if I start to echo madly or something, could somebody please let me know? I have um, a few thanks to start with. Um, and, and I should thank, so that I don't forget, Frank, first of all. That's a really lovely introduction. Thank you very much for that. Um, I have to thank the Miguel family. Uh, the Miguel family, whom you may or may not know, are a Kuna Rapahanak family, um, four generations of show Indians and theatre artists, currently residing in New York City, Toronto and Ottawa. As a non-native scholar, I could not do the kind of work in popular culture that I'm now trying to do without the support and generosity of the Miguel family. And if I'm lucky and my tech works, I hope that you will actually hear a little bit from the member of the fourth generation of that family. Also still, of course, in thank you mode, I very much want to add my voice to the chorus of thanks that have been heard across the symposium. This is a fantastic place. This is a fantastic symposium. I'm absolutely delighted to be part of it. I can't thank enough the team who've put together, um, I know it's always really hard work behind the scenes. I'm particularly conscious of um, depending heavily on Linda Clark and Sam Hanna, thank you, but I do know there are other members of the team whose names I don't know who will, have done, who will also be working very hard. And of course, thank you particularly to Jeremy Johnson for his vision, for his leadership, and I'm sure for his extremely hard work. Jeremy asked me to come and talk about the legacy of Buffalo Bill dime novels, and that is what I'm going to try to do. However, when I was doing the research for this paper, it took an unexpected turn, and I'd like to signal that by adding a subtitle. <laughs> I should just stop there. I think that's the wittiest moment in the paper. <laughs> um, just Three quick notes. I'm very much talking about Buffalo Bill, the figure who is constructed and represented in print culture. I'm really not talking about William F. Cody, the man about whom I know many of you know so much more and, and, and some 
some of whom are um, actually related to. So I'm talking about Buffalo Bill. Um, secondly, I was interested to hear uh, um, Shannon Murray this morning. Like Shannon, I've come down from Canada with my vocabulary, and particularly for this topic, I just want to signal that when I use Indian, I'm referring to the stereotype, the print representation. It's the habit where I live. Um, if I'm referring to a person, I tend to use indigenous or native or obviously the nation or tribal designation. Last note, there are so many echoes and overlaps in what I'm gonna say with so many of the brilliant papers and discussions that have come before in this symposium. I hoped, I had hoped, to sort of do shout outs to the relevant speakers as I came to those overlaps but there have become so many of them. I've been scribbling like crazy, up to and including this last brilliant panel we just heard and across so many of these brilliant and rich papers. Can I just please right now collectively acknowledge everybody's brilliance and when the echoes and overlaps come, you will know who you are. So thank you very much. <laughs> The late 19th and early 20th centuries were the itis years in the United States. Every new fad that came along and provoked cultural alarm was made into a chronic condition by the suffix itis. Telephone-itis, baseball-itis, postcard-itis, ping-pong-itis, and yes, dime novel -itis. The term was coined jokingly by Biograph Films in 1907. But the moral panic over dime novels tells us real things about the power of popular print culture generally and of Buffalo Bill dime novels specifically. That power is the subject of my talk. First, I'll address the distinctive standing of Buffalo Bill within the dime novelitis debates that takes me second to the interplay between print and performance in the Buffalo Bill industry. And finally, I turn to how one indigenous writer seized the power of Buffalo Bill's print performance dynamic for her own purposes. William F. Cody's contribution to the dime novel craze began in 1869 when he first appeared in a story paper serial written by Ned Buntline Buffalo Bill, the king of border men, or the wildest and truest tale I've ever told. <laughs> Buffalo Bill dime fiction came to outpace that devoted to any other single figure. It has been approximated as 2,000 printed and reprinted titles published in and beyond the United States in multiple languages by over 20 different authors including Cody himself. And I should say that um, both the McCracken and the exhibition upstairs have many of these publications. This voluminous print production was the scaffolding on which Buffalo Bill performance was built. Theatrical melodrama from 1871, The Wild West Show from 1883, and film from about 1894. Such publications were also the framework shaping audience, reception, and memory of these performance forms for decades after. Moral panic over cheap fiction went back to the 1870s. With innovations in press technology and transportation, cheap story papers began to flood the market, both in terms of mass sales and in the everyday visual life of cities, on newsstands, billboards, and shop windows. The publishers, Beadle and Adams, famously invented the complete novel for a dime in 1860, and Tales of the West became one of their signature genre. These developments led to vociferous public debate. As cultural authorities staked out their claims to power by demonizing or defending dime fiction. The readership for cheap fiction was very broad, cutting a wide swath through class, gender, generation, and nationality. In the words of one dime novelist, Frederick Whitaker, in 1884, quote, 
The readers of the Dimes are farmers, mechanics, workwomen, drummers, boys in shops and factories, and a great many people who are so much appalled by the abuse of the daily press that they do not confess what they have been reading. <laughs> Yet critics consistently characterise the audience for, for dime novels as boys whom dime novelitis infected with everything from lassitude to vagrancy to fantasising about violence to actually committing suicide and murder. In 1883, moral crusader Anthony Comstock turned his thunder against, quote, half-dime novels, five and ten-cent story papers, calculating, quote, 1,200,000 youths per week whose minds are being brought under the influence of these subtle poisons. The same year, legislation was introduced threatening imprisonment to anyone who sold, loaned, or gave a dime novel to any minor. These were the years when the face of America was being changed by uh, urbanization, industrialization, and new forms of immigration. Runaway dime novel reading boys stood in for larger perceived threats to the social order and justification for regimes to rein them in. In the midst of this furore, an odd little story began to make the rounds of the popular press. I'm just going to let you read it. <coughs> I understand that at least it was designed to be humorous, but I think it does at least three significant kinds of cultural work in joining Sitting Bull to the Dime Novelitis discourse. First, this piece inserts Sitting Bull by name into a scandal about an actual novel, uh, Daredevil Dan, The Prairie Ranger, which was being hotly debated right at that moment. Second, since Sitting Bull had returned from Canada and surrendered to the US military in 1881, there had been some preoccupation in the press with his relationship to literacy. It was reported that he had been taught to write his signature in Canada, he was purported to speak French and hear read English. One press man labeled him, quote, the Carlisle of the Plains, the scolding philosopher of the Aborigines. As the wars on the plains came to an end and reservations closed in, cultural, mainstream cultural anxieties about race and power manifested themselves partly in the fear that natives might in fact break out not just from their reservations but from their caricatures might in fact have unimagined language and intellectual skills. Third, the ref this reference to Sitting Bull draws attention to other tropes of Indianness structuring the dime novelitis debate. Repeatedly, the attack on boys' morality equates with, quote, Indian killing, as in the Puck cartoon. Here are three additional examples reaching from the dead serious to the satirical. The first one concerns Jess Pomeroy, the 12-year-old serial killer, on whom the press reported, Jess Pomeroy had an uncontrollable desire to commit torture on boys, which he thought might have come from reading cheap novels. He took great delight in reading Indian <coughs> tales where cruelties were described. Once he stole some money, with which he intended to run away and live with the Indians. The second one comes from the Atlantic Monthly, who took a more playful tone. Quote, prevented from engaging in hand-to-hand -hand conflicts with howling savages, the dime enthusiast can yet, if circumstances be favorable, break his teacher's watch chain. <laughs> Tapping into the same trope, another dime novelist, T.C. Harbaugh, jocularly imagined the critics imagining the dime novelist as Indian. Quote, 
Every now and then, the dime novelist utters a blood-curdling war whoop, and at the end of each chapter, dances a scalp dance with all its attendant horror. Rooted through the sensationalized representation of Indians was a pretty straight line connecting runaway boys and outbreaking indigenous people. Where did Buffalo Bill dime novels sit in all this? At first, front and center. From Buntline's story paper serial onwards, tales of Buffalo Bill in many ways fit what Comstock vilified as, quote, the blood and thunder romance of border life. The majority of the Buffalo Bill tales revolved around violent confrontations, usually in the West, shaped into sequences of captivity, chase, rescue, and melodramatic scenes of gunplay against white renegades and Indians. Buffalo Bill's name routinely appeared on moralists' lists of offenders, alongside Daredevil Dan, Wild Bill, and others. And Jess Pomeroy specified that his favorite fiction was Buffalo Bill dime novels. By the 1890s, however, while Daredevil Dan remained a byword for corruption of innocent youth, Buffalo Bill was fairly steadily positioned on the other side of the US moral ledger. One thing that had happened in the interim was a remarkable effort by publisher Beadle and Adams to change Buffalo Bill's image by promoting him as author and hero. And this is a list of all kinds of books published by Beadle and Adams, some by Buffalo Bill, some about Buffalo Bill. Their primary organ for this campaign was their five cent weekly story paper, first titled The Saturday Journal. And you can see here the portrait of Buffalo Bill and then the beginning at the bottom of a serialized story by him. I should acknowledge that the images I'm about to show, these all come from the University of Rochester. Um, the story paper changed its title to the Saturday Journal, I mean to the Star Journal, sorry, and you can see that Buffalo Bill is still headliner. Then it changed its name to Beadle's Weekly, it's the same um, editorial team. This, this one headlines a story about Buffalo Bill, this one headlines a story by Buffalo Bill, and the last name for the journal was the Banner Weekly, and again you can see Buffalo Bill is front and centre. This was a family paper whose contents support the claims of wide readership. The serialized fiction embraced both European romance and blood and thunder westerns, while the non-fiction departments covered topical events, editorial opinion, tips for ladies' fashion and etiquette, traveler's tales, correspondence columns, and so on. In 1876, the Saturday Journal cranked up the celebrity-making machinery around Buffalo Bill in response to two developments, the heating up of the dime novelitis debate and the battle at the Little Bighorn. With a blizzard of fiction and non-fiction items, the story paper essentially folded these two developments together and made Buffalo Bill the master of both. Now, I'm going to find this really hard to communicate. What happens is that the, the um, story paper pulls together around Buffalo Bill the question of his morality, his military heroism, his fiction by him, the fiction about him, and his prowess as a theatrical performer. And as you turn the pages of the story paper, it absolutely, or at least for me as reader, absolutely leapt out at me. I'm going to try to give a tiny taste of this by mocking up two slides. I'd, I'll see how this goes. This is when news, 22 July, the news is just coming east of the victory by the Lakota, Northern Cheyenne and Arapaho. Um, and what's happening in the Saturday Journal is on your left-hand side, you know, a sensational story by Buffalo Bill. And this column is inside as you turn the pages. And within this column, you get a serious, quite detailed um, note about Cody's movements as part of what's going on military-wise in the West at that moment. 
you get a demonization of the Sioux um, who, who they're after. You get testament to Buffalo Bill's personal character. And interestingly, that testament is directly joined to his fiction, which in this case is the, the story that's been printed. And then in what one would have thought was a complete non sequitur, it's also joined to um, his play. This one here is listed um, as part of what tells us what a morally upstanding, respectable figure Buffalo Bill is, but also a military hero, also the person who can write this kind of fiction. Let me show, and I'm just gonna do this once more, another page or another compilation slide, again from 1876, a bit later. This is September. Here we have again headlining a obviously sensational story by uh, Buffalo Bill. I'm, I'm gonna pull out a quotation in a minute from the advertising for the story, from immediately afterwards in the column, a, dis a sort of dynovelitis discussion, from immediately after in the same column, but I couldn't fit it all in, um, a report of that battle with uh, yellow hair or yellow hand that a number of people have referenced. Let me just try to pull out some quotes. So we have um, you know, the connection between Buffalo Bill just off to war, quickly finishing off this story first. We have a, a sort of mini dime novelitis debate, basically saying, well, all that other boy's fiction is rubbish because it's fictitious, but our work stands above because it's by the guy who is truly out west, you know, um, living the life that he's writing in his fiction about. Again, a direct connection. This is a quotation from how that action out west is being reported that um, the news from the seat of war often adverts to Buffalo Bill's performance against Sitting Bull. Performance now means obviously military performance. I'm, I'm missing out that account of the fight, but I would like to point out, and I'm wondering if this is the first report, in this report, in this context, it's very careful to see that the scouts did the ultimate violence, that in fact it was not Buffalo Bill, and I realize that changes later. And then there's a kind of final flourish at the end, managing to put together Buffalo Bill's honor, his respectability, the justification for his violence, and one last demonization of Sitting Bull. For several years, this kind of bringing together of these kinds of strands um, is, is very visible in the Banner Weekly in so insistently joining military heroism, morality, print, and performance, Beadle and Adams raised Buffalo Bill above the free of dying novelitis, and of course, defended their own fiction as, quote, good reading at popular prices to a better class of story readers. It was a small step from these maneuvers to joining Buffalo Bill to the nationalist project. In 1881, Prentice Ingram, who succeeded Ned Buntline as main author of Buff Buffalo Bill novels, Prentice Ingram positioned Bill Cody in a way that foreshadows Frederick Jackson Turner's 1893 thesis of the frontier as the distinctive staging ground of America's national identity. In the midst of this burgeoning moral panic, conflating boys and Indians, Ingram published Adventures of Buffalo Sorry. Adventures of Buffalo Bill from Boyhood to Manhood as the first number in the first volume of a new half-dime series, Beadle's Boys Library of Sport, Story and Adventure. While the action is an unrelenting sequence of fights and killings, they are structured around a conflation of individual and national maturation in vocabulary which Turner would adopt 12 years later. Ingram's story introduces Buffalo Bill as, quote, a child of the prairies, one of America's strange heroes who has stood as a barrier between civilization and savagery. And Ingram's story takes Bill personally and the nation generally through a whole um, series of developmental stages which are um, 
quite similar to the developmental stages that Frederick Jackson Turner relates, uh, relies on so much later. In 1884, Beadle's Weekly reprinted dime novelist Frederick Whitaker's assertion that, quote, the dime novel is now the only representative of purely American literature, a claim shored up in the paper's new head, the Great American Story Paper. In the same year, Buffalo Bill's Wild West adopted the same trope of America's national entertainment, here in a newspaper advertisement and then in the famous handbill, which I realize is well known to many people. From then on, the trading of tropes went back and forth among dime novels, the print apparatus surrounding the show, and the show itself refining and reinforcing the nationalism and the respectability of the Buffalo Bill industry. My argument in section one then is that when we read Buffalo Bill and Dime Novelitis together, we learn something about both. It becomes clear that the moral panic around cheap fiction extended well beyond social control of runaway boys to military control over indigenous peoples. As to Buffalo Bill, it becomes clear that his creation in print directly fed his performance career in terms of his own persona and in his positioning in, related, in relation to native figures. Sitting Bull for One was paraded in Buffalo Bill print long before he was paraded in the Wild West show of 1885. Approaching the making of Buffalo Bill through dime novels not only exposes some of the underpinnings of his perfor performance career, it reveals the continuing power of dime novel production to frame spectatorship well into the era of Buffalo Bill theatre, Wild West shows and cinema. This is the question wh to which I'll now turn. What recent reconstructions of dime novel reading might tell us about the power of Buffalo Bill dime novels to frame performance. This is a screenshot from Hidalgo, a film centered on endurance rider Frank Hopkinson's triumph in crossing the Arabian desert in the great horse race of the Bedouin in 1891. The film has been much debated, including by representatives from um, this institution, for its various claims. Today, however, all that I'm interested in is actually this scene in which Sheikh Riyadh, played by Omar Sharif, sits in his opulent royal tent, furtively reading a Buffalo Bill dime novel. <laughs> for the Sheikh, the dime novel is second in value only to the priceless breeding book handed down by generations of Arabian princes. The scene suggests the memory-making power of dime novels for both the film viewer and the film character. Some frames earlier, we have seen the Wild West show represented warts and all, Hopkinson drunkenly falling off his horse, Bill Cody cheating native performers. The film viewer can see something that the sheik cannot, the gap between the Wild West performance as represented, which he attended in Paris, and the romanticized print version that he carries into the Arabian desert as a mnemonic. But the Sheikh also sees something that the film viewer may well miss. The dime novel that the Sheikh is reading is an amalgamation of two actual books mocked up to look like an original dime novel. The masthead is that of Beadle's dime novel library, but the rest of the cover is from an 1887 children's book, which is here in the McCracken, an 1887 children's book, sorry, <laughs> I thought you could, that's it, um, which in a long poem of rhyming couplets sanitizes the violence of Western settlement as acts in the Wild West show. Far from being the kind of blood and thunder work that the Sheikh's admiration for Wild Bill Hiccup and Wyatt Earp suggests, the book on which the camera dwells is a primer on how to see the show. That is, the book is a literal, the book that's made into a dime novel 
is a literal extension of the show. The vision of the Wild West show's dependence on print production is expanded into a dark psychological study in Robert Altman's 1976 film, Buffalo Bill and the Indians, or Sitting Bull's History Lesson. Early in the film, the legend maker Ned Buntline, loomingly played by Burt Lancaster, warns Buffalo Bill, played by Paul Newman, quote, Bill, any youngster like yourself who figures to set the world on fire, best not forget where he got the matches. Throughout, Buntline sustains a kind of Greek choral commentary, analyzing and predicting Bill's every move. In his final scene, Buntline declares, Buffalo Bill, it's been the thrill of my life to have invented you. Lines which leave Cody staring in the mirror, horrified at the realization of his own unreality. The other truth teller in the film, of course, who also reveals Cody's hollowness to himself, is Sitting Bull, played here by the diminutive Cree actor, Frank Karkowitz. Refusing to act out the dime novel formulas that Buffalo Bill wants him to um, perform in the arena, Sitting Bull haunts Buffalo Bill as a man with more substance even after his death. Which brings me to my third reconstruction from the 2000 novel by Blackfeet author James Welch, The Heart Song of Charging Elk. Welch reconstructs semi-fictionally the experience of an Oglala performer abandoned by Buffalo Bill's Wild West in Marseille during their 1889 European tour. Part of the novel's power lies in Welch's handling of point of view, as the gaze travels back and forth between the alienated charging elk and those non-natives who alternately romanticize and demonize him. Among those non-natives is Franklin Bell, the American consulate in Marseille. He has never seen the Wild West show. His expectations of indigenous people come from popular print culture, specifically from Ned Buntline's very first story paper, Buffalo Bill, King of the Border Men. I'll just let you read that quotation. As Bell, as, a, as Bell actually meets the lived presence of Charging Elk in the novel, readers witness the effects of dime novel expectations through the eyes of both consulate and performer. In creating a doubly indigenous perspective, a Blackfeet writer creating a Lakota performer who experiences and resists the effects of dime novel representation, Welch exposes, plays with, and breaks out of dime novel frames. All three of these contemporary reconstructions strongly resonate with things that were said about dime novels in the late 19th and early 20th century. I'm actually going to not read you through that. I'll cut most of that, but we'll just go to one in historical precedence for the third of these reconstructions. And this is historical precedence for the movement that Welch reconstructs in Heartsong, that is the indigenous outbreak from the dime novel frame, which is where I'm going in part three. As long as there were Buffalo Bill dime novels, there were indigenous performers who managed to break their bonds, to turn the power of representation to their own purposes. Before returning to print forms, I want to pause in performance mode to show an example of this indigenous agency in action. In 1894, Thomas Edison filmed some of the Lakota dancers from Buffalo Bill's Wild West in his Black Mariah studio. This 15 second film shows Last Horse, Parts His Hair and Hair Coat dancing. 
Note how one in particular, not unlike Welch's charging elk, gazes back at the dominant gaze. Hang on. A hundred and twenty years later, the indigenous group, a tribe called Red, one of whose members is a member of the Miguel family and who are, um, his, his name is Bear Witness or sometimes Bear Witness Thomas. Um, they're, they are currently at least uh, located in Ottawa. The indigenous group, a tribe called Red, produced a, a track titled Burn Your Village to the Ground for American Thanksgiving. This was subsequently remixed by another indigenous group, Neon Natives. The video juxtaposes popular Indian stereotypes, centrally a clip from the film Adam's Family Values, with indigenous archival materials. In the following excerpt, we see and hear indigenous dancers of many nations, tribes and eras brought together to dance um, across the ongoing beat of history. Within this community that a tribe called Red and Neon Natives have, have created and recreated, there are two moments um, of dancing by um, Lakota performers from Buffalo Bill's Wild West. I'd particularly like you to look out for these Buffalo dancers whom we were just watching. The indigenous agency that these performances embody is what I want to address in this final section, like the video reaching back into the 1800s to present one case of an indigenous writer using the print performance nexus to intervene in her own dime novel representation. Around 1889, Seneca playwright and performer Gawanga Mohawk went on stage with her melodrama, Wepton Noma, the Indian Mail Carrier, 
The images of um, Gawanga Mohawk come from the Billy Rose Theatre Archive at the New York Public Library, the Harry Ransom Centre at the University of Texas at Austin, and the British Library. Um, Wepton Nomar was lauded by the press as, quote, alive with thrills and sensational adventures that sent delightful creeps down the spines of the breathless audience, including some tricks by Gawanga Mohawk's trained horses. The text and performance of this melodrama achieved at least three important effects. First, the central plot celebrated the moral agency of a young native man, Wepton Noma, in pursuit of the Mexican villain who murdered his father. It turned the stock representation of native violence in, for example, dime novels and Wild West shows into a story of motivated and reluctant revenge. Second, the play's success gave Gawanga Mohawk creative and contractual control far beyond those in any other entertainment employment available to indigenous performers at that time. And third, Gawanga Mohawk, who played the heroic Wepton No Ma, created for herself a gender-bending role. She explained, quote, I grew tired of being cast in uncongenial roles. I said to myself that I must have something free and wild that would fit with my own nature. I wanted to ride and wrestle and I thought, well, I can't do that as a woman. I must act a man or better, a boy. The costumes and roles which she developed on stage extended into her off-stage life. On seeing these off-stage images, several contemporary indigenous artists have read Gawanga Mohawk as two-spirit. Gawanga Mohawk became enough of a celebrity that two years after the launching of her melodrama in 1891, Prentice Ingram, Buffalo Bill's author, one of them, Prentice Ingram set out to capitalize on her name recognition in three serialized stories in Banner Weekly. So we're back to that story paper. First, Red Butterfly, the Spy of the Overland. Second, Gawongo, the Redskin Rider. And third, Velvet, Vel Velvet Bill's Vow. This miniseries, all of which starred a figure named Gawongo, attempt to contain Mohawk within the Buffalo Bill dime novel formula. Although in Ingram's version, Gawanga's prowess on horseback and in battle is very like that portrayed in her melodrama Wept on No Ma, there are two key differences. First, while the dime novel retains Mohawk's native identity, it moves her more closely to the Sioux template marketed by Buffalo Bill's Wild West, transforming the Seneca performer into what it called a, quote, Mohawk Sioux. Second, Ingram's Gawango dresses temporarily as a man to spy out the villain, but ultimately reveals herself to be a woman, which her original never did on stage, and she is claimed in marriage by Velvet Bill, a Buffalo Bill lookalike. Here, Gawango, and this is her on the right-hand side. This is Prentice Ingram's version of Gawango. She confirms her true essential femaleness in her own words in this quotation, which refers, her, she refers to, quote, my natural dress as a woman, em emphasized in italics, which really obviously compares to her earlier quotation in the press interview that she needed to um, behave like a man or, or a boy if she was going to fit her own nature. Ingram also straightens out her queerness by splitting the male character Wept on No Ma, which Gawanga Mohawk played in the melodrama, Ingram Ingram splits Wepto no Ma off from the maidenly Gawango, changing Wepto Ma into a Sioux warrior who dies in the course of the action. Two years later, Gawango Mohawk pushed back. When she took her troop off to Britain in 1893, hot on the heels of Buffalo Bill's Wild West European tour, she was at pains to stress to the British press 
that she was not, quote, one of Bell's Indians. From the moment she galloped bareback onto the stage of Liverpool's Shakespeare Theatre, she was an instant and enduring favourite, solidly entrenched in the provincial circuit with lots of bookings, press coverage and interviews, and a high level of interaction with British working and middle class audiences. As her overseas profile rose, Beadle publishers closed in once more, reissuing Ingram's series as three standalone dime novels in 1896, with new subtitles tucking her more firmly into the Buffalo Bill firmament. The first subtitle was changed from the Nine Scouts League to Buffalo Bill's League. The second was changed from the Moonlight Sorry. From the Moonlight Marauders to Buffalo Bill and the Surgeon Scout. So this is very systematic. And the third was changed from the Red Riders Retribution to Buffalo Bill's Quandary. And actually, in, there's a bit of a switch goes on as well. At the same time, the dime novel covers reduce her presence to a background blur. Uh, that's her with her arm raised. Um, interestingly, the overseas dynamic was different when the same year the British popular publishing company Aldine reprinted these novels in Britain, they kept Goango front and centre and closer to a queer appearance. This is Goango. As Mohawk completed her second triumphant tour of Britain, 1903 to 09, she flexed her muscle in the marketplace once more. She copyrighted a new one-act play, which was a direct riposte to Prentice Ingram severing Wepton no Ma from Gowango. In an Indian romance, Mohawk reprises her role as Wepton no Ma, but she now creates a female twin, Mirano Ma, for him, playing both parts herself. Her plot climaxes by killing off the Indian princess, the twin Mirano Ma, while the brother Wepton no Ma rides off into the sunset, firmly embodied once more in his original creator. The cultural work of the Beadle and Adams miniseries goes beyond the attempt to straighten and reincorporate one indigenous celebrity into the Buffalo Bill dime novel industry. Resituated in the site of their original publication, the Banner Weekly, Ingram's stories also speak directly to Sitting Bull. From late 1890 into 1891, Ghost dancing spread across the West. Sitting Bull was murdered by a member of the Indian police and the massacre at Wounded Knee occurred. In response, the Banner Weekly again redoubled its promotion of Buffalo Bill, using their departments to mount a running defense of Cody as military scout, you know, asked to go out West to intervene, and as showman, <coughs> and also using their departments to mount a running attack on Sitting Bull as, quote, the evil genius of the uprising. The fiction also joined in. The first of Ingram's Gawango series was in preparation as the news came through from the West, and its advertising was changed from a kind of general Wild West advertising to connect the story with, quote, the recent Indian craze and tragic uprising of the hostiles among the Sioux. The miniseries also kills Sitting Bull twice over with two stand-ins. Red Butterfly opens with the death of Gawanga's father, here called, quote, the Mad Chief of the Sioux, which is what the Banner Weekly sometimes called Sitting Bull. Velvet Bill's vow ends with the death of another Sioux chief, Wept Omar, at the hands of his own men. When the real-life Gawanga Mohawk negotiated the tools of popular representation, she was trying to exert control not only over her own image, but over the popular discourse of indigeneity more generally. Adams' 
At its broadest, dime novelitis speaks to the fear that what is represented in print will be performed in practice. In the dime novelization of native peoples, this fear was double-edged, that they would break out by performing the savage caricatures of dime fiction and or by flouting these caricatures with literacy and other intellectual and social skills. When we look at how Beadle and Adams's version of Buffalo Bill answered the combined threats of dime novelitis and indigenous outbreak, we can also see the power of print to frame performance, whether in the theater, the Wild West arena, or the battlefield. The hero and author embodied by Buffalo Bill combined print, performance, and power over indigeneity. When Gawanga Mohawk came on the scene, she was a competitor on all these fronts, one reason why Beadle moved to incorporate her into the Buffalo Bill pantheon. I'm arguing then that Buffalo Bill dime novels, massively popular and affordable fiction, widely circulated within and beyond the United States, participated in real struggles over cultural power. Disguised within the discourse of dime novelitis were stakes reaching from representational ruses by Anthony Comstock and other moral reformers to real world consequences for Sitting Bull, Gawanga Mohawk, and other indigenous peoples. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple questions. Oh, now we have time, you're not going to ask any questions. <laughs> Lou. Ed, we'll repeat the question for the camera. The question is, did you enjoy reading some of these dime novels? Well, um, kind of sometimes. I think it depends how, what you read them for or what I read them for. I was telling Frank the other night that when I was a graduate student in London, I read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dime novels at the British Museum, or as it then was, the British Museum Library. And I don't know if I enjoyed them, but I was absolutely fascinated. I was addicted to them, even if I wasn't aesthetically enjoying them. I will tell you, when I was reading The Prentice Ingram, Gawanga Mohawks, I was just totally into it. So yes, I was enjoying them because I was reading them in a really motivated way. But can I in myself recreate what must have been the enjoyment experienced by all those millions of readers, you know, so many years ago? I don't think I can quite manage to um, replicate that. Thank you. <laughs> Julia? The question is if there was any pushback from Buffalo Bill against some of these dime novelists who exaggerated somewhat or, <laughs> or individual stories. Um, can I just ask, do you mean pushback against indigenous um, oh, performers? No, I'm no. sorry. I mean in any way that there is that coded name was um, used in any of the ongoing Buffalo Bill um, material. Did he ever have a problem personally with any of the stories that were written with him in the series? Okay. Uh, this is not a perfect answer, not that I know of. Um, most of what I know about William Cody as a, as a human being, I have learned from you know, the research of other people in this room and beyond this room. But thinking back to Don Russell, who, who did one of the most methodical sort of sorting outs of what Cody might have um, actually written, what he might have authorized, what he couldn't have cared less about, Don Russell says that Cody, once Cody stopped actually having a hand in any, having, you know, the fiction he did write, um, uh, Don Russell says he doesn't think Cody actually read any of the fiction that <laughs> used his name so freely. But somebody else in the room might know better. Looks to me like Lewis Warnes might. Lu Lewis Warnes. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> So Louis Warrens is, Louis Warrens is asking, um, uh, how do I know that any of the fiction with Buffalo Bill's name appended as author was actually written by him? Um, I think Louis used the word definitely in there somewhere. Well, I don't definitely, but I do have an answer. One answer is that in the um, letters, the papers of Orville Victor, who was editor of Beadle and Adams, so these are private letters. Cody, right, when, when he's retiring, Cody writes to him and thanks him for his help editing the fiction that Cody was writing in his early days. And I assume that's true. That was not for publication, that was not for the show. I believe he did do some writing, Orville Victor for one helped him. Um, the other kind of evidence, and I do think Don Russell, I think it's Don Russell, or maybe, it's some, maybe I've got the wrong critic at this point, um, I do think there's internal evidence. There are you know, two or three stories that I think it is quite possible that they're written by Cody for the very unflattering reason that they're actually not very coherent at all. They don't read like a coherent plot structure that um, a more professionalized writer would be able to put together. Definitely as time passed, Prentice Ingram used or was, or was um, asked to use the Buffalo Bill name as author. Later, yeah, it's not Buffalo Bill later. But in the early days, you know, something like The Phantom Spy, two or three of these early novels, I actually believe, not definitely, but I, I believe that most likely they involved Cody having a hand in writing. Thank you. <laughs>